Okay, so let's try a round two of recording this lesson. Uh, it's a long one, uh, so uh, yeah, it's just a little bit long. Um, okay, uh, so a wave front moves towards the barrier, so this is our wave here, and we want to we want to find the the line that represents it being reflected. Uh, so whatever this angle is, this angle should be the same. So it looks like three would be the same angle. So three is a reflected line. Uh, a standing wave. So that was the pool thing that I showed you. So the standing wave, uh, how you create that is you need two identical waves with the same frequency. So uh, frequency over here, frequency over here being the same, and you send the waves towards each other and you get that standing wave. So two identical waves traveling in opposite directions passing through each other would be the correct answer. Uh, this one, we want to find uh, what would be the the interference. Would it be constructive, destructive? What would our, our wave look like if we sent these two waves uh, through each other? So we can see that we have crest matching up with trough here. So that's going to be destructive. And this is plus two up top and minus one down below. So if I add those together, it's going to be plus one, which it would be like this. So A is the correct answer. Okay, and then which of the following diagram shows diffraction? Well, um, this is polarization, we didn't talk about that. This is reflection. Uh, this is refraction, we didn't talk about that either. So sending a wave towards a barrier and having it bend around it, D, would be the correct answer. Okay, so today we're going to talk about music and resonance. And uh, yeah, so uh, uh, to start us off, I have this video here. And this is from a Netflix show, Explained. Uh, so watch the video. Uh, it's really cool, really good. They talk about some of the ideas that we're going to talk about in this lesson, so check it out. So there's three things that you need to know about music, three, three terms. So in physics, we call it frequency. Uh, in music, we call it pitch. So they're the same thing. Um, they're just different words for the same thing. The higher the pitch, the higher the note. Uh, the higher the frequency. So I can show you that. So I have two tuning forks here and um, they have different, you can see they're different sizes and they're different sizes because they have different frequencies. So here I have a 128 hertz pitch and I'll hold it up to the mic. And then I have a 256 hertz pitch. So you can see that uh, this one's lower, oops, and this one's higher. Hopefully that's not too loud on the mic and blowing your eardrums out. So the cool thing about these tuning forks is they're actually the same note. They're both a C note. So we have 128 hertz and 256 hertz, and they're just two different octaves. Uh, a piano has tons and tons of keys, but there's only a, B, C, D, E, F, G in music. So there's only seven notes. So what those, all those keys are is that they're just different octaves. So if you have 64 hertz, that's a C, 128, 256, you can see it doubles and it just gets a higher and higher note. And since this, the speed of sound is constant, this means that the sound wavelength decreases with higher frequency. So we know that V equals lambda F. So as we get a higher pitch or a higher frequency, our wavelength is going to get smaller. Another term that you need to know is amplitude. And amplitude represents the loudness of the sound. So this note would be quieter than this note. They have the same wavelength, they have the same frequency, but this is just a bigger amplitude, so it's going to be louder. And we measure loudness in decibels, named after Alexander Graham Bell. And the weird thing about decibels is it's not a linear scale, it's a logarithmic scale. So that means that two decibels is going to be 10 times louder than one decibel. And three decibels would be 100 times louder than one decibel. It's the same thing as pH if you've done that in chemistry. Just to give you an idea of, 
of decibels, a noisy classroom is 50 to 60 decibels, while a rock concert would be upward of 100 decibels. And if you're listening to anything over 80 decibels for a long period of time, it could cause you to be deaf. We have little tiny air hairs in our ears and they help pick up the sound and you can damage those hairs in your ears. And uh, yeah, so you'd wanna wear ear protection for anything over 80 decibels for a long period of time. And then the last thing that we could talk about is the quality of the sound. So the type of music sound from clarinets to pianos to human voice depends on the, the shape of the sine wave. So I can sing a, a C note with my voice, I can play a C note on the piano, I can play a C note with a tuning fork, but they all sound kind of different. So if we could see the waveform, uh, a tuning fork would produce almost a perfect sine wave. So if I played this tuning fork and I could see what the wave would look like, a computer generated image of the wave, it would be this nice perfect sine wave. But if I sang the same note as this, then it would be a little bit more erratic. It would still be repeating, but it would be more erratic and it wouldn't be that perfect sine wave. So different forms, uh, different waveforms give different sounds of music and that's why all instruments sound different. And the music is just that repetitive waveform. So even though it's not perfect, uh, it still repeats and it still gets that note and uh, it's still what you want. So the higher the quality, um, the pure the repeat of that waveform. So um, yeah, if you're playing a, a nice um, in tune instrument, it should repeat that waveform no matter what it looks like. So what our focus on this lesson is going to be is it's going to be on resonance. And resonance is the vibration that occurs in an object when it experiences the same periodic force with the same frequency as its natural frequency. So what that means is every object has its own natural frequency. Okay, uh, You might have seen this in... Um, in a wine glass, you can you can lick your finger and swirl it around a wine glass, and you can you can move it at a certain frequency and get that wine glass to resonate. Um, and you've probably heard of of opera singers breaking wine glasses. Well, that that's correct. They just sing a note that's at the natural frequency of that wine glass, and if the amplitude is big enough, if you get it swaying back and forth, then you can get that wine glass to break. So in order to get a wine glass to vibrate enough to break it, you must find the correct frequency in order to make that happen. So lots of things use this idea of natural frequency and resonance. Uh, microwaves use water's natural frequency. So how a microwave works is it, um, it sends out a, a wave at uh, 2,450 2, megahertz. And when it does that, that's water's natural frequency. So the water will start to vibrate back and forth, vibrate back and forth. And as it does that, it causes friction and it heats up your food. Um, that's, that's how microwave works. It just vibrates water. There's nothing dangerous about it. There's a lot of misconceptions about, um, about uh, microwaves are dangerous, but they're not. They're, they've been around forever. So here's a couple videos. So this verse video is... Uh, uh, showing a wine glass breaking at its natural frequency, so I'll play that. So you can see it's starting to resonate, it's vibrating back and forth, and then what they do is they increase the volume of that horrible noise, so they increase the amplitude, so it vibrates at bigger amplitudes, and eventually they get it to smash. There we go. So wine glasses aren't the only thing that have natural frequencies. Everything is a natural frequency. And this next video is uh, a bridge that gets vibrating against natural frequency. So a big wind uh, causes it to start to vibrate. And that wind was going the perfect speed to vibrate at its natural frequency. And that's not good when a bridge is doing that. So you can see the bridge is vibrating back and forth like that. And the bridges weren't meant to do this, so eventually it starts to break up. There was a dog in one of the cars there, and someone went and saved it. I don't know why you'd leave your dog behind as this is happening on the bridge. Uh, but there we go. It, it ends up collapsing, and that's bad uh, for a bridge. Um, 
So I can show you this as well. I can show you this idea of resonance with this. Let me switch to the camera here with this right here. So this is just a, another tuning fork. So tuning forks are really easy to work with because they have a very specific natural frequency. This is a C note, this is 256 hertz. And uh, I have another tuning fork here that is also 256 hertz. So if I take this tuning fork and I put it near it, what's gonna happen is this, this tuning fork is gonna vibrate back and forth 256 times every second. And it's gonna knock the air back and forth 256 times a second. And it's gonna cause this to start vibrating at 256 uh, times per second. And this box down here just allows us to amplify our sound. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit uh, later. And I'll put my mic by here. Um, so I'm gonna not touch it, but I'm gonna put it really close with it vibrating. And then I'm going to put my mic by here and you can see that it actually started vibrating without it touching. So. And if I put my mic by it, you can hear that hum there. And that's, um, that's the, it got it to vibrate without actually touching it, which is pretty cool. So this term fundamental frequency will come up and the fundamental frequency is the lowest frequency produced by an object that will actually get it to resonate, to vibrate. Uh, so the, the wave of a fundamental frequency will look different depending on what object you play it on. So a string, like a guitar string, um, will look like this and this is the, the fundamental frequency. So with this string, you picture someone holding it here and holding it here. So you're always going to have a node at this end. And what we're creating is we're creating a standing wave. So one person is standing over here, moving it up and down. One person is standing over here, moving it up and down. And you get this wave to just go back and forth, back and forth. So we have an anti-node here where there's lots of movement and a node here where there's no movement. Um, so, this is, so this is the lowest frequency where you can get this standing wave produced on it. Okay? Um, if you, and this is also the longest wavelength because this is um, half a wavelength. If I continued over here, that'd be a full wavelength there. So we can fit half a wavelength on that string. Um, if you increased your frequency, what you would see is you would see a wave like that sitting on it. Um, so where you always have to have a node at each end, and then you'd have two anti-nodes on it. And when we draw standing waves, we always draw the opposite side because it moves up and down here, it moves up and down here, but it doesn't move here. And if you increased your frequency even faster, what you could get is you could get uh, an even smaller wavelength fitting on there, right? Because uh, this is one wavelength here. So from here to here is one wavelength. Uh, and then from here to here is one wavelength. So the w as the frequency increases, the wavelength gets smaller and you'd have a different note playing on there. So to show this idea, I have this video here. And this guy is, he just puts his iPhone in a guitar and he plays the guitar and the iPhone picks up those vibrations on the strings. So you can check it out here. So you can see these strings all have different densities, so the wave would move uh, different speeds in there. And then they, he, he's using his other hand to make the string longer and shorter, so that plays different notes. But you can see those definite waveforms uh, on there. Those are little standing waves.
There we go. So what we're going to talk about now is we're going to talk about um, we're, we're going to talk about kind of that that tube similar to this. We're going to talk about how, how what makes an acoustic guitar work. So this um, tuning fork has a box on here, and what this box does is it helps amplify the music, and that's how an acoustic guitar works, right? An acoustic guitar that that wooden box helps amplify that sound helps make it louder uh, if you've ever seen an electric guitar played without an amplifier well it doesn't make very much sound because it doesn't have anything to amplify it and that's how acoustic guitars work so we're going to talk about how this works and this is a closed tube because on one end it's closed and on the other end it's open. And what you have to do to make this work is you need to make it a certain size in order to amplify the sound better. So this closed tube here, I'm just going to draw in an equilibrium line. And this is a very simple, um, this is like the simplest type of music that we're going to talk about. So this is my tuning fork here and the tuning fork sends a wave off of it. And what that wave is going to do is it's going to enter this tube. It's going to reflect off of there. I'm going to use a different color so I can draw. So it's going to reflect off that closed end and it's going to come back like that. And that's what the wave is going to look like in the tube. So what I can do is I can change the length of the tube. So picture I have a, this is a long tube and I have a saw and I can cut off this tube anywhere that I want. So I want to I want to cut it off at a place where the amplitude is the biggest. And the amplitude is the biggest where you have these anti-nodes here, right? Here at the node, the amplitude's nothing, so it's not going to create a loud sound. So the, the first place, if this is my closed end, the first place that I can cut it off is right here. That's going to be at an anti-node, and that's going to be where um, where I'm going to get a loud sound, right? The next place I can cut it off is here, or I can cut it off here. So I can change the length of my tube in order to make it resonate, to make it louder. So we're going to talk about this first point here, and I'm just going to draw the same thing. So this is my wave, it reflects off, and then I get this anti-node here. Um, so we're starting here. So we need to know how much of a wavelength this is. So if we go from equilibrium to the top, that's a quarter of a wavelength, because this is one quarter, two quarters, three quarters, and then we're back at the start here with four quarters. So right here is a quarter of a wavelength. So if we fit one quarter of the wavelength into the length of our tube, we're going to get it to be loud. We're going to get it to resonate really well. Okay. Um, so I can show you this. Um, I'm going to show you a little demo here and we'll see how this works. So I'm just going to move this and maybe if I focus my camera, it doesn't know what to focus on. Uh, let me turn the lights on a little bit. Maybe that will help. Oh yeah, it's a little bit better. I wish I could get it to focus on that tube. Anyway, so you can see this tube here. And what this tube is, is it's a tube filled with water. And then I have... And then I have another tube here, and I'm going to stick this tube in here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the length of my tube. So wherever my water is right here, it's going to cut off so that it's one end. And then I'm going to take a tuning fork, and I'm going to put it over top. And we're going to listen to where the sound is the loudest. Okay. So I'm going to put my mic right up to it so you can hear that resonating. I should be more. Right? So hopefully you can hear that in the microphone. But it's quiet here and it's loud there. Quiet, loud, quiet, loud. Right? So what we're what, what we're doing is we are 
finding where we can fit a quarter of that wavelength in there. So I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. So here it's quiet, 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 it's loud, and then it gets quieter, quieter, quieter as we approach that node. So, uh, so this is where it's the loudest. And what we can do is we can measure the length of our tube. So I'm going to get that sound again. There we go. So this is the length of the tube that I got it to resonate. And if I measure with my meter stick the length of that tube, it's about 31 centimeters. So 31 centimeters is the length of my tube. And what I can do with that is I can use this little formula I made here to, uh, to find out what my wavelength is, right? So the length of my tube where it resonated was 31 centimeters, okay? So I can take this one quarter of a wavelength equals the length of our tube. And um, I just move the four up here and then the one down below, but the one doesn't really matter. And I can find my wavelength. So my tube with 30 centimeters. And if I multiply that by four, then I end up getting, or 31 centimeters, I said 31. Um, and then that, so that's gonna be 124 centimeters. So that's the, 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 my wavelength, right? So if this is 31 centimeters, then this from here to here, 31, here to here, 31, and here to here, 31. So one wavelength is going to be 124 centimeters. And I know that my tuning fork, so this is my wavelength, I know that my frequency is equal to 256 hertz, because that's what that tuning fork is. And then what I can do is I can use V equals lambda F, and I can actually calculate the speed of sound in this room just by doing that little experiment. So if I open up my calculator and I go uh, 1.24, it's got to be in meters, so 124 centimeters is 1.24 meters, and I multiply that by 256, then I end up getting that the speed of sound in this room is 317 meters per second. So these next tubes are, where's my next resonating point going to be? So here's another antinode. Um, so I'm fitting in one quarter, two quarters, three quarters. So for this tube, I fit three quarters of a wavelength into the length of my tube. And that's where my next resonating point could be. So I can draw that in. This is my first resonating point. And then it goes back to a node. And then it goes to an antinode. So this is three quarters of a wavelength fitting into the length of the tube. So what I can do with that information is I can calculate, well, where's my next resonating gonna, point gonna be? And I can test it out. So if I just go three quarters, it's still the same wavelength, same note that I'm playing, times 124 centimeters. I can find out what, well, what does that tube length need to be? So just three quarters times 124. So if I make my tube 93 centimeters, well, that's going to be my next resonating point. And then what I can do is I can use, is I can mark where 93 centimeters is. So I can use my meter stick. And I can mark 93. So you can see that line there. I want 93 centimeters um, right here. And uh, so when I make my tube 93 centimeters, we should be able to get um, our next resonating point. So let's test that out. So hopefully you can see that black mark there. So right there, I'm getting that resonating point. And yeah, it's right around our black mark. So it's, a, it's kind of a crude measurement tool, but we get it right around that black mark. So we can find out where our next resonating point is going to be. Right, and then our next resonating point is gonna be here and you can see a pattern. So this is a quarter, this is three quarters. So this is gonna be five quarters of a wavelength fitting into the length of the tube. That's where our next resonating point is going to be. So that's our first one, back to a node. That's our second one, 
back to a node. And then that's our third one at five quarters of a wavelength. The other type of uh, resonator we can have is, is an open tube. And it's, this, it's the same idea. So I'll show you an example of an open tube. So I have these, which are boom whackers, and you can see they have notes on them, right? So they're just hollow tubes and they play different notes because they're different lengths. So when I get it to vibrate, it makes a note, right? So um, yeah, that's all that an open resonator is and how that's the simplest form and how it works is uh, it's exactly the same as a closed tube. The only difference is, is that, um, if I draw on this equilibrium line here, you have to have an antinode at both ends, right? A string, you have nodes at both ends. A closed tube, you have a node at one end, and then so you have antinodes uh, at both ends. So we're going to start with an antinode. Like that. And then we'll just repeat the same thing on the other side like that okay so same idea we want to we want to make our tube length uh, a certain length in order to get it to uh, resonate properly so um, the first place where we're going to get an antinode here is right there and if we uh, let's draw the next one so the next one is right there and if we figure out how much of a wavelength it is right so this is a quarter this is two quarters. So two quarters or a half a wavelength is fitting in there. So if I draw that, there's half a wavelength fitting in the length of that tube. So we have half a wavelength in the length of our tube. And then our next one is going to be, there's three quarters of a wavelength and a full wavelength. So this one happens at a full wavelength fitting in the length of our tube. And then our next one is gonna be here, and then that's another half wavelength. So we have three over two wavelengths fitting in the length of our tube. And we can draw this. So this is our first resonating point, and then we go back to a node, and then this is our second resonating point. And we can draw on this one as well. So this is our first resonating point, go back to a node. Our second resonating point, go back to a node and then we fit three quarters of a wavelength into the length of the tube. And it's, it's the same idea, it works the same way, it's just got slightly different numbers, and we'll do some questions with that. Uh, so the last thing before we do some questions is this idea of overtones. So if the length of the tube is fixed now, well, I can fit different frequencies into the same tube. So if this is a closed tube and I fit a quarter of a wavelength into the length of the tube. Well, this is my fundamental frequency. This is uh, the longest wavelength, the shortest uh, frequency that I can fit into this tube. But it doesn't mean it's the only thing that'll resonate in this tube. If I put a smaller wavelength in here, so let's put something a little bit smaller. Right, so you can see that it's definitely a smaller wave. And I got it to resonate when I fit three quarters of a wavelength into the same length of the tube. So the tube length is the same, right, for both ones, but I can I can make two different note resonates in the same tube. And this is the idea behind if you've like down south when they play the jug and they go ooh, 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 ooh. they play two different notes in the same jug, they get them both to resonate uh, the same way. Um, yeah, so, th so that's all that is. But this, this longest wavelength, shortest frequency is our fundamental frequency. And we can do the same thing for this, right? We can fit half a wavelength into the length of the tube or, oops, <laughs> screwed that one up. Let me erase that, erase. Or I can fit a bigger, or a shorter wavelength into the same thing. So if I fit a full wavelength uh, into the same tube, then I can also get this to resonate, right? So both of those frequencies will resonate in the same tube. And this is our fundamental frequency right here, our biggest wavelength that will fit in. Okay, so let's do some questions. 
So a 440 hertz tuning fork is held over the open end of a closed tube and it resonates at its fundamental frequency. The speed of sound is at determine the distance between resonating points. So the first part of this is pretty easy. Right, anytime they give you a speed and a frequency, we can find wavelengths. So we'll do that. So we'll plug in our speed of sound, which is 347, divide it by 440, and we get our wavelength to be 0 0.7886. Okay. This question is asking the distance between resonating points, and it does say that it's a closed tube, but it actually doesn't matter for the distance between resonating points, right? If we look at an, a closed tube here, we have right here, this is half a wavelength, right? This is half a wavelength. This is our next resonating point. This is half a wavelength. It's always going to be a half a wavelength in between these two points, right? And we look at an open tube, so this is our first resonating point. This is half a wavelength. This is half a wavelength, right? It doesn't matter which one. The only difference between a closed tube and an open tube is where they start. This one starts at a node, and this one starts at an antinode, but it's always going to be a half a wavelength in between our resonating points, right? So it's a closed tube, so this end's sealed. So we can draw that on. Here's my equilibrium line. So this is my first resonating point, this is my second resonating point, and this is my third resonating point. And we know that it's half a wavelength, half a wavelength in between these resonating points. Right? So if I take my full wavelength and divide it by two, it's going to be half a wavelength. So I take that answer, divide it by two, and I get 0 0.394 meters. So this will be 0 0.394 meters. This next one will be 0 0.394 meters. So the distance between my resonating points is 0 0.394. And this is half a wavelength, and I go back to the top, that's a full wavelength. Okay. My next example, a tube that is open at both ends, so that's key. It's an open tube, it's 45 centimeters long. The fundamental frequency is at, find the speed of sound in the room. So we have an open tube. It's a fundamental frequency, so if it's an open tube, There we go. We need antinodes at both ends, and we start at the top and we go to the bottom, uh, so half a wavelength will fit into the length of our tube with the fundamental frequency. Okay? And it also tells us in the question that our tube is 45 centimeters long. So if we want to know what a full wavelength is, well, this is half a wavelength fitting in the length of our tube. So if we doubled our tube and we went like this, right? This, we start at the top, go to the bottom, and then back to the top again. That's a full wavelength. So a full wavelength is going to be 45 centimeters and 45 centimeters. So our wavelength is 90 centimeters. Okay. And then they have the frequency. So we can just use V equals lambda F. So we know our wavelength is 90 centimeters or 0 0.9 meters and our frequency is 128 hertz. So our speed of sound in this situation is 115 meters per second. Okay, okay so I have a couple board questions. So pause the video and give them a go, and then I will go through them. A tuning fork is held up to a tube filled with water, and the distance between resonating points is set to be 80 centimeters. So that's key, right? Um, uh, tube filled with water, so it's a closed tube. So it's gonna, there's my equilibrium line. So that's my first resonating point, that's my second resonating point, third resonating point, fourth resonating point, and they say the distance between resonating points is 80 centimeters. I also know that that's half a wavelength, so this is 80 centimeters as well, which is half a wavelength. So that means that my wavelength has got to be 160 centimeters. They give us the speed of sound, so we can use V equals lambda F. And if we want to find the frequency, we put lambda down below. So our speed of sound is 207. 
and then our uh, wavelength is 1.6 meters. So we get our frequency to be 129 hertz. And then our last one, give this one a go. A trumpet uses an a, a open tube, find the distance between the mouthpiece and the end. So we want to find the length of our tube. And it's an open tube. And it's saying the fundamental frequency here. So that's when we fit half a wavelength into the length of our tube. So if we want to find the length of this tube, the distance between the mouthpiece and the end of the instrument, um, we need to find the wavelength. And they give us the frequency. They give us uh, the speed of sound. So we can use V equals lambda F. And we can find our wavelength. So if I go 342 divided by my frequency of 262, I end up getting my wavelength is equal to 1.3 meters. So I'm not fitting a full wavelength in my instrument at the fundamental frequency. I'm only fitting half a wavelength. So I need to take that 1.3 meters and I need to divide it by two, right? I need to half it because that's all that we're fitting into that instrument. Oops, wrong one. So if I take that and I divide it by two, I get my instrument to be uh, 0 0.65 or uh, two or 65.2 centimeters, right? Or 0 0.652 meters, same thing. And that's all. Okay, so this is your homework. Give that a go. Uh, it, it's, it's a weird lesson, confusing lesson, kind of different than the stuff that we've done before. Uh, shoot me an email and we can figure something out if you're having troubles. Um, yeah.